So we will now move on to, uh, um, to our last environment we are presenting um, uh, or are having in this uh, first hour session. Uh, that will be the um, Marcos um, open source MRI environment. Um, and actually we will have two presentations, um, one on the um, hardware um, design, which will be presented by uh, Benjamin uh, Menkuch from uh, the FH Dortmund, and uh, one which is focusing on the software and firmware design, um, which will be given by Vlad Negevitsky. Neg uh, Negevitsky, that's the, the right pronunciation, right, Vlad? Yep, that's right. Okay, um, from Zurich. Um, uh, I guess you will um, just coordinate how how you share um, the uh, the remaining time and uh, switch in between, and then we will have questions uh, at the end, right? Yes, Benny? yes, we will do that. Okay, excellent. So the stage is yours. Then uh, we are uh, waiting excitingly for your presentations. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Benjamin Menkrich and I'm with FH Dortmund. I'm going to talk about the hardware that can be used with the Marcos environment. I have nothing to disclose. Marcos, which stands for Magnetic Resonance Control System, was developed by us about two years ago. We started with this. Before, we were using OPRA, which was developed at MGH by Thomas Witzel. When we used OPRA, we ran into so, some uh, limitations that um, yeah, inspired us to develop Marcos and Flopra. Marcos and especially um, Flopra. Flopra is the part of Marcos that runs on the FPGA. Vlad will tell you more about this later. It's a, a streaming-based approach. It's, it's, a it's a little bit similar to Hard Vista, as it like, uh, takes all the complicated stuff of the sequence, puts it on a, on a higher level so that the low level uh, can just uh, stream the sequence out to the hardware. Therefore, it can theoretically run unlimited long sequences. The timing resolution of Marcos is 8.138 nanoseconds. It's, it's a, a bit odd number because uh, it's based on the clock frequency of the red beta, yeah, which is this hardware where um, Marcos runs on. And this red beta yeah, has a clock frequency of 122.88 megahertz. It has on this hardware, there are two RX and two TX channels um, that can be used. For, so for example, you, you could do a quadrature setup already with this hardware. The bandwidth uh, you can use is up to about uh, 30 megahertz, which is equivalent to a field strength of about 0.7 Tesla. The bandwidth here is limitation translates directly to a maximum uh, field strength that you can use it with because we are using direct RF sequence, um, direct RF um, sampling. So there is no analog mixing after this uh, red pit IR. Uh, you will see this um, more clearly in a slide after this. All the hardware which uh, we use with Marcos not all the hardware, but most of the hardware uh, is completely open source. Uh, and also the software is completely open source and it's fairly affordable. It, the whole system costs only about 2000 US dollar. Here you can see a small uh, tabletop system that we have at FH Dortmund. This is a magnet, and here you have a small sample inserted. This is the TR switch, and outside is the red pitta and the gradient amplifier, which is not shown on this image. 
this slide shows how the external hardware is connected to the red pit IR, which runs the Markov system. The red pit IR has um, yeah, a combined FPGA and CPU. This uh, combined IC runs Flopper, which is the FPGA part of Marcos, and also the Marcos server, which runs on the Red Pitaya CPU. Also on the Red Pitaya PCB, there is uh, yeah, there are two ADCs and two DECs. The ADCs are directly connected to the low noise amplifier, which gets the signal from the TR switch and the TR switch gets the signal from the RF coil. So you see there is no analog mixing as it was uh, yeah, usually done in conventional high field MRI systems. On the TX side, we have the uh, the DAC, which uh, puts out a signal, it goes directly to the RF power amplifier, then goes into the TR switch and then to the RF coil. Then we have here the gradient system, which shows a gradient power amplifier. This block also includes a DAC because the red pit IR outputs the, the gradient waveform in a digital data format. So the DAC has to uh, create an analog waveform out of it. Then uh, the waveform is translated into a current, which is output by the gradient power amplifier. It goes uh, through some gradient filters and then to the gradient coils. You can also see there are some orange connections visible here. These um, are connected to the GPIO pins of the red pit IR. Some GPIOs are used, for example, to gate the TR switch so that if you have an active TR switch, you can uh, toggle between transmit and receive mode. And some GPIO pins are also used to receive data from the gradient amplifier. For example, one gradient amplifier that I will show later has the capability to monitor the current and that can also be used uh, to calibrate the gradient amplifier. This slide shows how the, yeah, basically the, the DSP of Marcos is um, arranged inside and outside of the FPGA. First, you have when the signal goes into the red pit IR, there is an analog low pass filter for anti alias purpose. Then the signal goes into the ADC. The ADC of the red pit IR is a 16 bit ADC and it runs with the global clock frequency of 122.88 mega sample per second. Then here there is the I, I call it the software defined radio part where we have a complex multiplier that's, uh, that's uh, a digital component that's running inside the FPGA. And this uh, complex multiplier is doing the down conversion of the received signal into the baseband. After the down conversion, there are CIC filters for, yeah, for basically for decimation because you usually don't need the full bandwidth of the 122 mega sample per second. The um, image bandwidth is usually much smaller. And um, if we can decimate the signal, um, we can reduce the data rate by a lot. So um, that's usually done. The um, decimation factors, they can be uh, controlled by the sequence and they can range from about uh, 4 to 4095. There are also shown here some FIR filters after the CIC filters. FIR filters are usually recommended after CIC filters because CIC filters 
don't have a flat frequency response. They, they have a roll off uh, at the edges of the passband. So it's recommended to use a FIR filter after them to compensate for that. But since the data rate is already pretty low after the CIC filter, this FIR filtering does not need to happen inside of the FPGA. It can be done on a higher level and therefore the FIR filters are not an integral part of the Markov system. On the TX side, it looks quite similar. We have the baseband IQ data. It goes into a complex multiplier. So it, it basically mixed to the RF band and then it goes directly into the deck. Here on the image, I also show a low pass filter. However, this low pass filter is not really there as like an explicit component on the red pitaya. The red pitaya does not have a low pass filter. However, the hardware that comes after the red pitaya, like the HF power amplifier, uh, they usually have some uh, low pass characteristics. So that this low pass filter is not always needed. This slide shows two gradient amplifiers that can be used with the Marcos uh, system. On the top, you see the GPA FHDO. This is a gradient amplifier that also includes the DAC. So it's like a two in one. It's completely open source, open hardware. It can do four channels with 10 amp each. And it has a current monitoring and auto calibration feature. We plan to also add a bipolar voltage output in the future so, so that you can use it with other gradient amplifiers. On the bottom, you can see the Okma 1, which is DAC only and partly open hardware, partly commercial product. It has four channels and uh, unipolar and bipolar outputs. You can find more about these here at these uh, URLs. Now I will hand over to Vlad and at the end of Vlad's um, presentation, I will be also available for questions. Hi everyone, I'm Vlad. Um, sorry, I have a bit of a cold, so I may cough a bit, but let's see how I go. Um, can you see the display correctly? Uh, yes. Okay, great. So as I say, I'm Vlad. Um, I do pay development on the Markov system and I'll be discussing the software and firmware of the design. So just to mention the goals of the project originally when we got started a few years ago was to make a system that was more capable than existing inexpensive consoles could actually do more complicated sequences to make a platform that was open and easy to reproduce with um, replaceable interchangeable hardware, and to also facilitate various ways of interacting and programming with it. So this includes PulseEq, of course, and this was aimed to suit different users in different groups. And some of the specific firmware goals that we had was to yeah, um, do up to 30 megahertz baseband sampling rates, um, unlimited sequence lengths, essentially thanks to the streaming, which we can do now more or less, um, and two receive and two transmit channels with independent frequency control for both. And also for the independent RX and TX sides of each channel. Um, and now I'll tell you about how we structured it. So essentially you have the host PC, which um, everything's in Python on there. So it runs in Windows, Mac or Linux. And you have the Red Pataya, which Benjamin showed you already. Uh, they communicate via Ethernet. And on the Red Pataya, you have the hardware interfaces to the GPA board, um, the RF um, IO, and digital inputs and outputs, which can also be used for external triggering and so on. Within the hardware, there's this uh, Xilinx Zinc chip that does most of the heavy lifting. And this has a C++ server that talks to the host and it runs FPGA firmware, which does all the real-time stuff. And then on the software side, we have this Marcos Python client. Uh, which can be talked to by a number of different um, ways. So you can use a GUI to interact with it. You can write direct NumPy data arrays. 
There's a simple domain specific language, which is sort of like the Magritte language, if people are familiar with that. And of course, you can also use Polseq, which is one of the biggest ways people have been testing it out. And essentially, once you run the system in practice, the compiled sequences are sent over from the client to the server on the red tire. And the server does all the processing and runs the FPGA, and then it sends data back to the client again. And to give you more insight into what exactly is different about the system versus many others, um, so it's written in a software-defined radio architecture style, which means that you have the server, which um, starts with a compiled sequence from the client. This is already um, binary instructions. These are sent to a decoder and sequencer, which then, instead of worrying about different uh, kinds of I.O., like RF versus gradients, et cetera, it just sends them to a very similar set of buffers, which then control the outputs and the timing. And then data is... Um, Data always has an 8.1 nanosecond resolution on each buffer. So there's no real concept of a raster clock. Everything can just be run with arbitrary timing the whole way through the sequence. And then each of these buffers sends data to its assigned channel, so to say. So you have the TX and the RX oscillators. You have the uh, digital outputs. You have the RF envelopes, um, uh, which control the IQ samples before the complex multiplication, which Benjamin mentioned. Um, you also have control of the RX parameters. So mid-sequence, for example, you can change with deterministic timing the sample rate, like make it higher or lower, depending on what you might want to do. And you can control the GPA via its serial interface. And then on the return side, um, and all of these have a very flat kind of interface, which means they're easy to maintain, easy to swap around, which is useful for people uh, familiar with FPGA development. And then all that data is sent to the um, Rx and Tx change, which Benjamin has already shown you. So those changes then handle the actual um, heavy lifting of the RF side. Then on the return side, all the data is sent back from the receiver chain uh, into receive buffers, each of which can store around 30,000 samples. And these are then read asynchronously by the server, which essentially reads them out when it has time to do so. And this is done so that, for example, you can run um, a block of acquisition at the full sample rate of 30 megahertz for a short amount of time, fill up the buffers, and then, of course, you have idle periods where you run various other pulses. And during this idle period, you can read it out and then send it back to the server. Now, essentially, the interface between the server and the FPGA is streaming, so it can run an infinite sequence once it's on the server. Right now, the interface from the server back to the client isn't yet uh, streaming-based, so that's one thing we need to still work on. But nonetheless, you can run fairly realistic sequences. Um, yeah, and this data is read by the server synchronously, as I mentioned. Um, then on the software side, so this is the Marcos client, it runs entirely in Python, and it does all the hardware control and sequence compilation. Its native format is NumPy arrays, which is simpler than it might sound. Essentially, just with this quick example, uh, the first two lines specify TX0 and TX1. Uh, let's just look at TX0 for now. So we have events at 50, 130, 200, and 360 microseconds, and values on the output that should be 0 0.5, 0, 0.5j, and 0. And you can see here that TX0, I, and Q, the real and the imaginary parts, they go up to 0 0.5 at 50, down to 0 at 130, which are these 0 0.5 and 0, then up to 0 0.5 on the TX0, Q at 200, and back down to 0 at 360 as specified there. So it's a very simple interface. You can do the same thing for the gradients and all the other outputs. So it's actually quite easy to write scripts to do these sorts of things directly in Python. Uh, but we also have full support for PulseSeq at the moment, uh, thanks to Lincoln at MGH. And we've tested it out elaborately with the MATLAB PulseSeq, but um, it should work fine with PyPulseSeq as well. And it might even be more straightforward because then everything's directly in Python. One difference from many other consoles is there's no hardware raster. Everything is timed with like an absolute event timer. So there's no need to choose a raster clock explicitly. You have to, or sorry, there is a need to choose an explicit raster clock to actually get um, a valid seek file generated. And there's also a desktop GUI that we have um, developed at CSIC in Valencia. And this runs a range of free program sequences as we get the system more and more advanced, this link proof. And we plan compatibility with importing policy scripts into it as well. And this is just a screenshot of the desktop GUI taking a picture of an avocado.
And now um, some of the users and the images they're taking with the system at the moment. So this is taken in Benjamin's lab at FH Dortmund with a phantom. Um, here's some data that's being taken um, in Leiden, essentially with a 50 milli Tesla Halbach scanner. And this is just a, a forearm. Uh, at MGH, they're also using um, the GPA FHDO developed at Dortmund. Here it's just shown also with a phantom. Um, and at Valencia, they're using a similar Halbach scanner to Leiden um, and doing in vivo acquisitions um, at the moment and investigating the various sequences they can try there. So that's about it. Essentially, we have a lot of work to do still. One of the main things is adding client server streaming because it's becoming slowly a bottleneck as you go to more and more uh, realistic clinical style sequences for this system. For education, it shouldn't be an issue, but uh, we want it to be used for both in the end. We want to be able to, <coughs> I'm sorry, we want to be able to support multiple synced STEM lab devices so that you can have as many channels as you need. Um, add features to the GUI essentially so that you can do more um, advanced sequence in the salon. And one thing we've really been trying to work on a bit more is the documentation. Um, so to learn more, you can try the tutorials at our wiki page on GitHub. Uh, you don't need any hardware for tutorials, so you can just play around and download the code. Or you can email me directly and have a chat. We also have a Markov Slack group for all the users, so there people ask questions and um, you can get direct feedback more quickly usually than from me. And yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, thanks to the whole Marcos and Okra team. Uh, yeah, um, if you have any questions for Benjamin or me, please go ahead and ask. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Benjamin and Vlad, for, for the presentations. It's a quite exciting uh, um, project and uh, um, seems to be quite, uh, quite powerful. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I was um, getting two questions, no, one question in, uh, I guess, uh, Benjamin already answered uh, it. The question was about the, um, whether the hardware could also be used uh, within 1.5 Tesla system. Um, yeah, I, I answered that question in chat already, not uh, with the current uh, red pit IR that has only a sample rate of 122, but uh, it's in theory possible to port a Marcos and Flopa to another hardware that has a higher sample rate and then you could use it or you could um, use an external um, analog mixing. Okay. Great. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you were mentioning, uh, Vlad, uh, the, the Pulsec uh, framework, which is connected and that other frameworks could also uh, make use of it. Who would be the right uh, um, contact to, uh, to get in touch with if um, somebody is interested in porting another framework to the Marcos system? Um, I guess to start with, you can just message me directly or chat on the Marcos group. Um, so you would essentially need to uh, talk directly to the Marcos client's Python backend, which is a pretty simple API. Um, so as long as you write the software that outputs these NumPy arrays, of which I gave this um, brief example earlier, if it outputs arrays like this with times and events, then it should run completely transparently with that. Now, one thing to mention is uh, we don't have real-time features yet in this. Uh, we sort of want to put them in the server in the future, but this is still in planning. So of course, right now it's purely um, one, uh, one directional. You have to compile the sequence and send it over. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, let me see, I don't see more questions at this time. Um, Oh, Maxime was um, um, was asking uh, regarding higher fields. Uh, any possibility for sideband uh, sampling, or will the input analog filter kill everything? Um, I'm a really my ignorance. I'm not an MRI person, but what is sideband sampling? If someone can give a one sentence explanation. Um, uh, I, I guess um, Maxime is uh, referring here to uh, um, uh, looking at uh, um, um, at the lower frequency of an of a modulated signal. Um, 
so where you would have um, um, uh, two bands and looking at the lower um, uh, or the, the higher yeah, harmonics. Um, uh, um, uh, I see. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no actual input analog filter on this current version of the retro tire. There's just a transformer and then the ADC directly. So, okay. <coughs> so in principle, it should be fine. It would just alias down into the ADC's band. You might need to do some custom analog filtering of your own to avoid too much noise. That should work fine, I imagine. Okay. 